So here's the outline of the talk. In principle, I have put in some things that you hopefully will never have to deal with yourself. So the first two topics are things that will be done at the summit in the telescope, at the data center. And then there is a rather long list of things where it might be that some of these corrections you have to do yourself. In some cases, you might have to see if there are residuals from these steps. So it's stuff that might be in the data. It's not fully clear yet if you will have to deal with it or if it will everything be taken out. The fourth point is more or less to say this is a short list of options what you can do to improve the data if you find some of the trends for some of the steps that you will have to do. In general, <coughs> One thing in Old Creek, Panta Ray, everything is flowing. So that is more or less the problem for the DECAS project right now. In some of the cases, we think everything will be covered. For some of the points, it's not clear if the automatic data reduction will be able to capture it. So some of the stuff might end up on your table. Most of it most likely will be out of your reach. The main aim of the talk is training in pattern recognition. And more specifically, if you recognize these patterns in your data, you know something went wrong. So that is more or less the aim to say you can recognize things that are not looking right. What will be done at the telescope in real time? It's more or less to say there will be two corrections. One of them is the nonlinearity correction for the CCD pixel. Means the nonlinearity of a CCT or sensor means the number of counts is not directly proportional to the number of photons that you get in. If you double the number of photons, you might get not double the number of counts. And that is something that you have to correct in each and every image. The second thing is what is called usually blemish correction or something similar. Some CCD pixels just might be dead. There's nothing to correct for. You have to figure out where they are, take them out of the data. That one will be applied more or less in real time in the camera software. <coughs> there will be a measurement of the nonlinearity response. There will be an identification of dead pixels. <coughs> the main problem is that stuff will be hardwired. So if something is varying in time, it's an effect that can slip through because you can't do the correction at the telescope itself. The second thing, which hopefully or is planned <coughs> to be taken over by the data reduction pipeline, is the gain correction and the spatial alignment. That, again, is something which expected, <coughs> is expected to be hidden from the user because you have to process raw data to do this. So that is something that should be done before. I only put these two points from the data reduction pipeline here now in this talk. The reduction process has a much larger number of steps that you are not going to see, and the people of the data center will present some of this, I forgot, on Friday. Thursday? Thursday, okay. So in principle, there is a lot of stuff still going on behind the scenes that you as the final user are not going to see or won't have to do yourself. So how do you do the gain correction? In that case, the gain correction is something that is pixel by pixel. Each detector pixel can have a different response. But that one now really is only the linear intensive response. So it's more or less you put in a correction. In some of the cases, you have dust and dirt. This pixel gets a lower intensity all of the time, but it's more or less a constant factor. And there will be two types of data used to make the gain correction for DKIST. One of them is what is called the solar flat field which basically means it's just an average spectrum. So you have all of it, <laughs> or everything in it that you have also in your data. The x-axis is the spectral dimension, that's the dispersion. The y-axis is the spatial dimension along the slit. Vertical stripes, in some of the cases, are the spectral lines that you actually want to observe. Some of them actually are interference fringes, and once we'll Everything that is not really a spectral line is something you want to correct for it. The other type of features that you have is stuff that goes from left to right. In the case of the upper one, that is on purpose. That is what is called the hairline. It's a thin metal wire that you place across the slit. Then you first can use it for alignment of the instrument. And the second thing is if you have a slit show camera, you can see exactly where the camera actually is looking at. The other thing that here now goes from left to right on the slit <coughs> in the spectrum is just dust on the slit. The thing that you know here in that case is if it extends across the full spectrum, it has to be upstream of the spectrograph because it's spectrally resolved. 
if it's only a small patch, then you know it has to be close to the camera because it doesn't get spectrally dispersed. So more or less in the solar flat field, you have exactly the same structure and information that you have in your science observation. Second example is the lamp flat field. That in principle is just a continuum, broadband light source. All of the spectral lines are missing. All of the other features that you have in this one are in there as well. In principle, the difference is here, everything that is not homogeneous is something you have to correct. And here you have structures, actually, you do not want to remove from the data because you still want to see the spectral lines in the end. This one. Christian, can you repeat the question? Somebody asked so the rest of the can hear. Which ones? There's a lot of slides. <laughs> so the, the dark ones? No, no, the, the, the bright ones in the middle. Oh. Next slide. Well, two slides later. Because there's yeah, some spectral yeah. lines. Yeah. 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 Can you repeat the questions? When there are two slides later? Because there are something special. Can you repeat the questions when there are two slides? Oh, okay. Okay, so what are the horizontal lines? They will pop up later because actually it's something special. It's a very specific feature. So just because Jenna said also to put in some information on how the stuff is processed in the background, how do you actually get the gain correction? In that case for the solar flat, it's more or less easy. You have the average flat field image. You average in Y, so more or less you just average along the slit. Then you get the red line here, which is the average profile. And then you go row by row through the image, divide each row by the average profile. Then you get the residual, and that more or less is the thing that you have to take out. That is how much an individual row of the CCD differs from the average spectrum. And then you just take the individual gain rows, put them back together, have the gain table. You divide the two, and then once will you get OK, you have a nice halfway flat spectrum. The spectral lines are still maintained. Some small scale features are removed. But what you also see is, for example, the interference fringes are still in the data in that case. And that is the main problem to say for the, using the solar flat field. If you do the average in the y direction, everything that is still visible in the average spectrum cannot be corrected. So the spectral lines are maintained, but also the fringes. And now we come to, OK, the strange pattern in the background. That is something which usually comes in addition. In many cases, if you use CCDs or sensors at long wavelengths above 700 nanometers, in some of the cases, the chip becomes partly transparent to the light. The light comes in, hits the CCD, goes through it. Then there's a circuit board on the back of it, which has metal wires. It has connections. Then the light gets reflected exactly on these metal wires, and on the way back, it gets registered. And that is something which is common for many CCDs if you use them at long wavelengths. You more or less see the circuit board behind the chip. And that is one case for the Swedish solar tower. Actually, you can read the name of the manufacturer in Woodcourt. <laughs> so in principle, that one is why you have to use the lamp flat stuff along the slit. It doesn't average out, so you can't correct for it. The main problem is you cannot simply rely on the lamp flat alone. Because that one would only work if the lamp illumination is perfectly homogeneous. As you can guess, it's not. So in principle, what you have, this one cannot correct for everything. It usually introduces intensity trends in the, spectral, uh, <coughs> the spatial dimension. The final result is what you usually have to do is a two-step correction. You have to use both the lamp flat and the solar flat, apply corrections from both of them. Okay. Questions on the gain corrections. And the hope is you are not going to have to do it yourself, but in principle, there are features that can be left over. Okay, the question was what photometric precision is expected. In principle, I don't know. There is a spec for it. I forgot what the numbers are. In principle, it more or less depends. What you usually get is it's less than 1% in accuracy. The main difference also between the lamp and the solar flat is the lamp is much less bright than the sun. So there's always a question of signal to noise in addition. Any more questions on gain? That is one problem to say. 
Okay, what is if the flanges are not perfectly straight? Then I'm principle for the game correction. The main problem is if they are not visible in the average profile because they are skewed. You do the average, they disappear, they will be corrected. So it's more or less not the orientation of the fringes that is critical, but is there a residual in the average profile? So that is the criterion for stuff that stays and stuff that gets removed. Fringes uh, will come separately later on. And that is another thing that hopefully or <coughs> will be done at the data center. There are more or less two more steps that are critical. One of them is the data or spatial alignment, especially for the instrument DLNERS that uses an integral field unit. You have to descramble the actual data. Now that one here is not what DLNERS is using. That one is an integral field unit based on lenslets. And what this one does, it creates a lot of spectra on the CCD. Each spectrum has an individual spectral line in it, but before you can use the data, you have to figure out how do all of these spectra belong again in a two-dimensional field of view at the entrance of the instrument. For DLNERS, it's going to look slightly different. They have to do the descrambling. The only comment here is it might be if the descrambling doesn't work, spectra get misplaced. So we have something that doesn't line up. Second thing, which is more or less for all of the biggest instruments that do polarimetry, all instruments are going to use dual beam polarimetry. So at some moment you split off the light, you have two beams with complementary information, but before you can use the data, you have to align these two beams with each other. And in the case of slit spectra, more or less you have two effects. If the alignment in the spectral axis didn't work out, you see each and every spectral line double. It just means there were two beams, they were misplaced, now you add them, everything is double. And <laughs> means for the point here is, this one is the telluric line, so in the Earth atmosphere, this is not the Seaman effect. So that might be something, <laughs> and the other thing is to say, you see it then in every spectral line in the spectrum. The second thing, which is more or less exactly the same in the other axis, if the spatial alignment didn't work in the Y axis, you get more or less every feature double. That is something that is easy to see here in the grid line image. In solar <coughs> observations, sometimes you can still see it. You will see there is sort of a shadow behind the actual image. And then you know that is more or less the same image with a slight displacement twice. In that case, it's something that you cannot correct yourself, but it's to say if you see the pattern, you know something went wrong in the data reduction. And now <coughs> the actual tasks that most likely or with some probability are going to end up on your table. So how does it invincible work if you have the perfect spectrograph alignment? You have the entrance slit of the spectrograph. You might have hairlines or might not have that mark the field of view of the camera. We have the crating with crating grooves. You have in the end the CCD. If the CCD, the crating and the slit are perfectly aligned, then more or less to say the hairlines get imaged exactly on CCD rows. The spectral lines get imaged exactly on CCD columns. And then the principle is what you want to have. The x-axis on the CCD is the dispersion, is the wavelengths. The y-axis is the spatial axis along the slit. But it requires that all of these things are perfectly aligned to each other. The slit parallel to the grooves, parallel to sensor columns. Now, what can go wrong? <laughs> First thing, which is halfway common, is the camera is rotated. And if the camera is not aligned with the other two, the dispersion direction does not go in along columns.